So while they do that, actually, let's just do a quick uh, welcome, welcome introduction. Good afternoon, uh, everyone back for lunch and networking. Very, very happy to be uh, presenting. Glad, glad to see your, your smiling faces here. Uh, my name is David Corliss. I am very honored to be presenting at this conference. This really is a, a, a premier event in the analytics and data science and AI and ML space here in Detroit, and it's a very great privilege uh, to be speaking here. This particular talk, my own particular background is, uh, is uh, strong in analytics, uh, but uh, this is geared a little bit more. This is not going to be, you're not going to be seeing lines of code or you know, a, a whole lot of detailed technical explanations. This conversation, now if you're on that side, I think they're going to be full for, for both on the business side and, the, and strong on the analytics side as well. Um, this, this, the focus of this talk is going to be on the business side. We're going to talk about uh, the top use cases, uh, give a quick rundown of basically how they are, why you would want to be using AI. The focus here is going to be on manufacturing, but I have to say that you, know, what, you can do a regression to, to make the assembly line run better to have predictive results. We'll have an example of that. Or you can uh, use it for other things. So the specific context is going to focus on manufacturing. Um, but uh, we're gonna, they're going to be applicable in a lot of areas. We're going to talk about the culture that's involved uh, to make the cultural changes. This is some of the things that we talked about uh, that uh, our keynote speaker, Jan, talked about this morning. So we're going to talk about how it isn't only the technology. There are going to be cultural differences and changes um, that have to happen. And we're going to talk about the kind of leadership qualities that are going to be needed to drive greater adoption of AI and machine learning. Oh, I'm sorry, I've got the wrong slide deck up there. I'm sorry, this is another talk that I gave. Um, do you, did you get, I can email it to you. This is the wrong slide deck. I'm sorry, I didn't even realize. Did you, do you have my slide deck? And that's the one you got. Okay, let me, I'm very sorry. Th that's actually a presentation I gave yesterday for, at, a, the, at the University of Michigan. Um, let me get the right deck up there. I'm sorry, I didn't even realize it looked similar. Terribly sorry about that. That's the one. I'm sorry, I had two different decks. I'm sorry, that's the one. I had the wrong, that was my fault, not our tech support, which is second to none. They're absolutely wonderful. That was my fault. I handed off a slide deck with the wrong uh, slide deck on it, one of the presentations I was giving just at University of Michigan yesterday. I'm sorry, this is the correct slide deck. My fault, my mistake, and thank you very much for getting that set up. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, um, I, yeah, I'm David Corliss. Um, some of you might remember me from Ford Motor Company. Some of you, I was there for a number of years. Some of you might remember me from Stellantis, where I was until recently. Uh, but I uh, recently joined uh, General Motors. They've uh, rebooted their OnStar uh, insurance program, so they're going to be selling auto insurance again. They just got started in Michigan. They're in all 50 states now. Um, so I'm uh, assistant uh, vice president for analytics there. Uh, in particular, my end of the my end of the space is the the data science that's used for non-actuarial stuff. It's still an insurance company, so they still have to look at people and see how risky they are. Uh, in this case, for auto insurance, they have to look at their policies and how much they cost. Uh, and then we've got a data leader, and I've got the, the fourth person on, leader on the analytic team. I've got the non-actuarial analytics, um, claims, and marketing, and customer experience and a lot of other things. The, so the focus on this, today we're going to be talking about AI in the manufacturing space, but that's going to touch on uh, some other things as well. I should probably mention the last point, one of the things that uh, some people will know me from, I'm a volunteer uh, doing uh, statistics for social good. So just like the, uh, the doctor will work one day a month at the charity clinic, the lawyer takes a pro bono case, my organization is called PeaceWork, uh, we're statisticians and data scientists. We take pro bono cases like they do. So there's a website if you were ever interested in that. All right. So uh, as I was before, they, they corrected my mistake. Um, we're going to be talking about AI use cases, looking at the technology. 
we're going to look at the culture that's needed to drive greater adoption of AI and machine learning and give some guiding principles and keys to success. I think you're going to find, if you saw the keynote this morning, this is almost going to be like the, key point, the keynote 2.0. We're going to talk about the same thing, some of the same things that we saw before. We're going to take those concepts, especially the speed of trust. We're going to take the concept, which is expressed broadly there. We're specifically going to talk about how that's critical to drive the adoption of analytics, especially modern analytics using AI and machine learning. And the examples are going to be all from automotive manufacturing. Smart processing. So all, you've heard about analytics. If you're not actually using it, what is the kind of things it's good for? And if you are using it, but you might be talking to the people on the business side that haven't gotten the memo, this is the memo. This is the story that you can tell. Increase efficiency. Everybody wants to make things run more smoothly, faster, less downtime. Lower cost. We'll talk about how that happened where we turn technology into dollars, how AI and machine learning uh, in, uh, in industrial space is almost like printing your own money. Defect defects, we'll have a specific example of how that's often done. And really when I say defects, that can actually be, that can be, a concept can be broadened. We're gonna look at manufacturing defects, but think of things that go wrong. We'll call that a defect. We're going to expand that concept for just a moment a little bit more broadly. It could be a call to the call center that really ticked somebody off. That would be a kind of a defect because you've got thousands of calls calling through the call center and one of them was just a bomb. Well, that could be, you can think of a call, a call center contact as a part that's being manufactured. You've got standards around for doing that. How are we going to use AI to make that lower cost, more efficient, and fewer mistakes? Reduce downtime, uh, as, there, as was mentioned in one of the uh, uh, presentations earlier today, one that I happen to be in, it was right here in this room. Uh, you know, uh, automotive plant produces right around a vehicle a minute. Uh, having been in the automotive plants a fair amount myself, I can tell you they measure it in seconds and even tenths of seconds. Um, if you're working in the auto industry and you haven't had a chance to get into a plant and see how things are done, get in one of the plants. If you're working in a hospital, get out of the office and see what's happening on, on a ward and so on. You need to see where the data are collected and used to see how the AI is making a better impact. Having a close connection with that is a really good thing that uh, analytics people need. Reducing downtime can be uh, advanced with the science, but you have to be familiar with what's happening on the floor. And predictive maintenance. Things just wear out. One of the things that we're able to do with, uh, with advanced AI uh, is constantly monitor the performance of a machine, look at how, long, how often the maintenance happens. If we can predict maintenance, we can have the maintenance done when the machine is down, not when it's running and you have to, and these are the worst words in the automotive. You know, I've worked in different parts. Right now I'm working for an auto insurance company that's owned by an auto lending company that's owned by an OEM, and I'll still tell you, the worst words in the automotive industry, the entire industry are, it stopped the line. Predictive maintenance, if we don't do that well, there's a risk of stopping the line. So, we're going to look at four use cases uh, to give a little bit of a, a background on them. One case that's used most often, we'll call that classification. If you're in a marketing space, you'll call it segmentation. One of the things you'll find is that there are multiple, uh, multiple names for the same kinds of things. In classification, we're taking the everybody and we're breaking it up, maybe into multiple buckets, maybe just two buckets. But the idea is everybody in one bucket is like everybody else in the bucket and different from the other buckets. Good parts and bad parts. All the good parts, the little bit of bad parts. And all the parts over here are good, unless that's a false negative, it's bad and you didn't catch it. All the parts over here are bad, unless it's a false positive and you marked it as bad and you check it out and it's actually good. We'll talk more about that. Proper application of AI can make that assignment and make it more accurately, even more accurately than people, but 
There's an even better situation than just having a machine do it, having the algorithm do it. You can work in partnership with people. We'll talk a little bit about that. So some of the things, uh, some of the things that are our advantages is that we can reduce the amount of bias. You know, an algorithm doesn't get tired, isn't thinking about what he or she is going to do when they're off work. Think of the natural human limitations of quality control people who are in a plant or in any other quality control situation. Um, there are human physical limitations. There are only so many things they can see. Nobody sees every particular concern. Uh, we can have measured outcomes without bias. Without bias. We can do supervised or unsupervised, if you're not familiar with that language, two different kinds of ways machines learn, algorithms learn. One is we're going to take all the bad parts, look at what they're like, and use them to find other bad parts. That's called supervised, because you had a list. It's called labeling. You have labeled data. These are the bad ones. These are the good ones. We're going to look at those two and make an algorithm so we get with new parts. We can split them up into those categories, good and bad. Unsupervised would be, we don't know. We're not going to, maybe we don't know, maybe we can't know, but we can say, when we look at parts, human interactions, whatever you're talking about, they break up into different groups, and some of those groups are going to perform better than others. And in that case, we're letting the data tell us what the best consolidation into groups really are. You might also find, in the case of things that aren't just yes, no, these are really good, these were really bad, and there are some gradations in between, or strengths and weaknesses. Uh, but one of the advantages of that is you can do both supervised, you've got a list of good ones, a list of bad ones, and then uh, use that to train others, or you can start with no rules at all and let the data tell you the answer. It works both ways. Usually people, human beings, work really well with supervised. They have something specific they've been told to look for, and then they can go out and find it according to the rules. Uh, and they tend to be very, very weak. We don't know what we don't know. What are we supposed to look for? This is something that machines, uh, machine learning is especially good for. Things to watch out for when we're doing classification. If you have something that happens rarely, Usually you're talking about really bad things. You don't want them to happen a lot. And yet those really bad things are things you care about a lot. And so you're going to need a lot of information. You're going to need a lot of data, a lot of individual occurrences. We'll call those records. You need to be able to find out rare events. Rare, rare, finding rare events is a specific challenge. Uh, and you'll find some people with a lot of experience in, in that particular kind of thing. So it's something that you'll find in uh, data scientists and uh, you know, AI machine learning people. You'll find people on the resume. I've done a lot of fraud detection, defect detection, uh, loan failure detection. All the, when you see the word detection, you're probably talking about something that's bad and rarely happens. And that's kind of a skill by itself. I'll give you an example, classic example in the automotive space. Defect detection. We're going to be looking at parts. Oh, by the way, just something that, um, talk about how this uh, presentation was, was put together. Uh, a long time ago, I worked for Ford, looked, worked for them for a long time, worked for Stellantis for a while. Now I'm at General Motors. You will not see any of them mentioned in this talk. Uh, the presentation that you will see, for example, the picture on the right, that was from Volvo and this from a press release. So um, this is a book report presentation. I've been searching everybody else's press releases for the last five years to get the best examples. So these are all really good examples, but I'm not promoting any particular machine learning tool or particular company's products or saying there's problems over here. I'm looking at press releases to find really, really, you know, it's a great way, just a little bit of a secret, a great way to put a talk together because you know the stuff is in the public domain. I don't know who, I'm going to have to look, I don't know anything about Volvo except what I read in the news. And so, um, I take what they, what they published and put that out there. It's a good way to put a, a talk together. You're guaranteed to not be dealing with proprietary information. So let's look at this example from Volvo. They've got this a tool called uh, UVI. It's an ultraviolet light I. And they put the, uh, put the car through a photo tunnel, pick, 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 pick. Look at it in ultraviolet light. It was originally developed in Israel 
to determine security threats on vehicles, like a bomb stuck under a car. Um, the important thing here is it's a worldwide set of opportunities to be learning from. If you're the only going what's happening in your own R&D department, you're gonna miss stuff. Uh, and so in this particular case, the technology was first developed as a defense system in another country, on another continent, but uh, here we see the same technology. And so it's important to be able to think broadly, think of the kinds of problems, the kind of challenges you have, and how can this other technology be applied to the particular challenge that you have. This particular uh, solution, I mentioned UVI uh, over at Volvo, but it's been used by a whole lot of leading manufacturers in our space. Regression, you know, as, as a person who's, you know, a classically trained statistician, my PhD is in statistical astrophysics, um, and, and uh, done a lot of forecasting over the years. Yes, I'm another one of those theoretical physicists working in the AI space in the automotive industry, and there's more of us than you can shake a stick at, two sticks. Um, and so I, when I first heard of regression being described as a machine learning algorithm, that was like, but people have been doing regression since about 1922. So uh, it's been around for a, a little while. Classification um, is another. The, the methods get better, but what we found is that really what's happening with machine learning, or as I like to call it, automated statistics. We talk about automating a scientific process. Machine learning is, uh, machine learning is an automation of statistical analyses. So you can do it at high volume, do it with more accuracy, do it on a whole lot of individual instances, get a lot of records, do it on big data, do it in real time. You know, you can't get you know, a, a problem that you're having with the car, send it off to the uh, analyst, wait for six months, or six days for that problem with the car to come back. You wanna be able to uh, diagnose that very quickly, even in real time, if you can. Uh, and so this, automation of traditional, slow-moving statistical processes. This is what machine learning is really about. That reminds me, I should make a mention of language. Um, people use machine learning and AI, artificial intelligence, they often use the term very broadly. I use them very narrowly. And, and I encourage use of this language, use the words however you like, but here's the thought. The way I just, when I say ML, when I say machine learning, I'm talking about the algorithm. And so machine learning is always a noun. It's random forest or XG boost or regression or what have you. Machine learning is the algorithm. It has the advantage of the more times you run it, the better the algorithm performs. That's why we call it learning. AI, AI is the decision that's made. So you run an algorithm, I'm gonna call that ML, the decision it makes, for example, you put your foot on the other brakes, your car begins to slide on a slippery road. The machine learning algorithm, the ML, detects your sliding. The AI is, it's gonna automate pumping the brakes. It's gonna flip on that bam, 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 faster than a human being can do to pump your brakes and you'll stop and still be able to steer. So the way I'm using the language, ML is the algorithm, AI is the decision made, assisted using that algorithm. So, that clarified. So we've got regression algorithm, what does it do? It predicts. It takes a whole bunch of factors, all the ones that really matter, and it makes a prediction. This is what we say that the outcome is gonna be. Used in all kinds of things. Used in root cause analysis. When this th problem happened, why did it really happen? What actually went wrong? We're gonna be looking at uh, a lot of different cases, when you have a number of factors, you're gonna predict a single outcome. Regression is one of the most common algorithms uh, that gets used. Advantages. <laughs> it, right around this year, I'm gonna to have to find out when the first paper was published, but right about the 100 year anniversary of people using regression to solve problems. Yeah, once upon a time, people worked this out with paper and pencil. Uh, a long time ago, the first regression algorithm I know of that was computerized ran on these things called uh, uh, computer cards, punch cards. How many people remember punch cards? 
cards. Fewer and fewer every year. I've never actually run punch cards, but it's been a near miss. I've held them in my hand, but I haven't programmed with this one. Back in 1968, a grad student um, figured out how to do regression for the first time using punch cards. His name was Jim Goodnight, and he finished his master's degree and started a company called SAS. So this has been around for a long time, and people know that it really works, and people trust it. So when you tell people this is a regression algorithm, the leads are going to trust it, the regulators are going to trust it, a court of law is going to believe it, this is one of the most reliable methods. And there's nothing black box, you have a list, these are all the things that we know predicted this outcome. They all get their own weight, because some are more strong predictors than others. And you put it all together, and here's your outcome, simple, reliable, maybe not the most advanced method for difficult or complex problems. So sometimes you can start with regression, but then you move on to more advanced methods. I'll give you an example. I love this example. It's one of my favorite examples uh, about uh, how machine learning can, can make a, a real impact. In this particular case, um, a, uh, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Robert Bondar uh, who's currently president of the Detroit chapter of the American Statistical Association, where I'm the uh, community liaison to national over there. Uh, Bob Bondar was working for BASF downriver here in Metro Detroit, and he got a complaint from the folks they were selling parts to. They were looking at dashboards on cars. Now, the, the actual part, not the stuff that's stuck into the dashboard, the dashboard itself is made up of two parts, because if you hit that dashboard in, an, in a car accident, that's going to be a bad thing. So they make dashboards soft and squishy, not like when I was a kid. But the, the soft and squishy stuff is a little fragile as well. So, it, so the surface of what you see and the front end of the car is made of two parts. There's a soft, squishy, sponge rubber stuff, and there, there's a vinyl skin that goes over it. And that's the thing that you actually see. There's sponge rubber underneath, but it's two parts, and they have to stick together. So they got a complaint that, man, your, your, your parts are failing, your skin is peeling off from the spongy rubber underneath. And I can tell you all about this because it's all been published in an IEEE article that you can hunt down if you want, want to find. Um, and we said, we tried everything. Well, they didn't try everything. In fact, they had specifically discounted the people working in the plant in this case. No, it couldn't be that. Um, the, the person looked into it, looked at all the data, looked at temperature, looked at how it was being used, all these circumstances. Took a long time to figure out what was going on, finally included weather. And found out that the occasions when they were having a lot of delamination problems, when the skin wouldn't stick to the spongy rubber underneath, were high humidity days. Because what was happening is a film of droplets of water were forming on the inside of that vinyl skin, and it wouldn't stick. So you look at enough factors, you can track down the one that actually makes the difference. Machine learning is really good for this kind of thing. You can look at a lot of parts, you can look at you know, a lot of different uh, predictors. Um, I once did an economic study using data from the World Bank. And it was country by country by country by country. And this is originally compiled by, the, I used it for something else. It was in my statistical volunteer stuff. But I use World Bank data because I was looking at other countries that, that, that did certain things. There are two and a half thousand different things the World Bank uses. I found five that were predictive for this particular problem. But if you've got a whole lot of predictors and you want to cut through them, regression is a really, really good way to do that. In this particular case, it was humidity above a certain level they fixed this problem, they didn't change the glue, they didn't change the process, they didn't change the parts, they didn't change the people, they changed the air conditioner and it fixed the problem. Regression is good for that, it'll track down all the different things and find the ones that really matter. Optimization. Make a process more efficient, make a process run faster, what's the best it can run. Um, some people will use something called uh, linear programming. Uh, the, original, the first time this was ever done was just after World War II, when there were a whole lot of really, really, really smart mathematicians, mostly British, and they were doing things like breaking codes. And then the war ended and they had no more codes to break. So what did they do? They fixed the mail system in what used to be Germany, which was in a bad spot just then, 
uh, and they wanted to make sure all the mail got delivered at a reasonable rate. And there was this radar station out on the North Sea coast that had five people in it. And you had other places like Berlin, which has a few more than five people in it. And they had to figure out what was an efficient way to get the mail to all the people who needed to get it. That's the first time this was ever used. It is still used by the post office today. These are the people who figured out that if you never have a post, well, not never, almost never, have a postal truck, you know, the ones that drive around with the mail in it, if you have them make right turns wherever possible and avoid left turns wherever possible, they'll get done faster. Have fewer accidents, fewer problems, fewer traffic jams, and that's why you will almost never see a postal service truck turning left. That was an AI problem that was solved only five years ago. So, optimization. Lots of different, any process that can be made better. Henry Ford famously said, there is no process that cannot be improved. This is about process improvement. It's also very computer intensive. It uses a lot of resources. It can take a long time to get answers. You can make small improvements. One thing that's in particular is a weakness of this method, sometimes you get a better method, but not a great method. You may not find the best. Um, also optimization, it's kind of an odd duck. There just aren't a whole lot of folks doing it. You're gonna find, you know, you usually, you know, in data science, you've got to find, oh, I've done this and I've done this and everybody's done regression. Optimization is something that you really want a specialization. If you want to work on efficiency problems, streamlining problems, faster, less expensive problems, get someone who has a lot of experience in this thing. It's something you can literally make a career out of. Anybody here make a career out of optimization? I know people who have, and I am not one of them. I'm more of a multitasker. You'll see, it's a rare skill, but you'll find, you know, this person over here, they're an optimizer. And you want to look out for people if you have these kind of problems you want to solve. I'll give an example, paint shop scheduling. This is from, who is this from? Uh, can't remember whose paint shop that was now. But it was, um, uh, this was actually published in Open Source Journal. We'll talk about that in a minute. So, paint, now, optimization. The idea of optimization is there's some number and you want to make it smaller. Often that number is time. Sometimes that number is cost. Time and cost often run in opposite directions. If you run something faster, it's more expensive. If you run something slower, you can cut the cost. So they often fight against each other. But pick anything you want. In this particular case, it was a paint shop, and the number they wanted to shrink was emissions from the paint out to the atmosphere. This is a really, really cool study, and it shows how versatile this process is. It's about taking some number and finding a better way of arranging things so that number gets smaller. It can be pretty much any number you want to shrink. This was paint emissions from an automotive paint shop, and they rescheduled, they worked on scheduling to reduce as the so loss function, they're trying to shrink the amount of, of paint emissions. So they got about the same number of throughput and they got about the same amount of cost and they were getting all the cars painted, but emissions were cut to two thirds because they improved their scheduling in the paint shop. This was done by a university professor in China and published in a journal. This came from no automotive company. This doesn't come from a think tank or a government research place. This was published in an open source journal. There is amazing research on AI and ML out there that nobody's reading. So cast a wide net. Google is your friend, but also network. Find out who else is doing cool stuff. Go to conferences, I don't have to sell you on that one, but this is why you go to conferences, because you find out about stuff like this. This was published in an open source journal for free, and it made a huge impact on a lot of people's business. Neural networks. Deep learning is just deep as in more layers in neural networks, so in the same category. You might hear neural networks and different kinds of it, and then you hear about deep learning, Deep learning is a subcategory of neural nets where we've got, multi, I won't get into coding, multiple layers instead of just, just two. Um, but the, this is something that's fairly new. It's a pretty hot topic. It's really, really popular in universities. You hire someone out of, the, out of university with a master's degree, real good possibility they've seen some of this. If anything, it's kind of strange. Fewer people are doing regression now. They're going straight on to this. Um, Lots of different applications 
all, it's almost always some kind of prediction that's being made. Um, and it works really, really good for complex situations, for complicated things or situations where you found maybe a weak answer and you want to get a better answer. It works well when you're dealing with text analytics. One particular problem is that these are sometimes called black box models. In terms of how they make the projection, you don't really know very well. That's going to be just fine for some things. If you're, for example, running a marketing campaign, or if you're, uh, you know, you, for, although that was done with optimization, think about the, the paint shop problem. You could also have done that with uh, neural net to optimize scheduling. Um, in that case, you don't have to justify what goes into the model. You just have to notice that the model actually worked, that the prediction is better. In a regulatory environment, sometimes models get reviewed by regulators. Sometimes models even get sued in court. It happens, especially in finance. Uh, so uh, there are going to be some situations where you can use this and some you can't. You need to be thinking about the regulatory environment. If someone is going to say, prove to me your model works and show me everything that's in it and why, think about regression and maybe something else, but certainly something that's tried and true. If you have to prove to an independent party who is not an analytics person that why the model does what it does, this is not a method you're going to want to use. If you aren't in that space, absolutely, this is something a method to try. Give an example. Logistics robots. These are autonomous vehicles that you never see because they run around inside of plants. They work in teams. One is in a vehicle. One robot is a picker where somebody on the line says, oh, we're going to need, you know, uh, we're, we're going to need more lug nuts down at the end of the line where we're putting on wheels. You got a bin full of lug nuts, so we're starting to get low on lug nuts. So you, the person doesn't go and fetch the lug nuts anymore. What happens is you uh, basically uh, send a, an email, but it used to be you send an email to a person in the warehouse. Now you send the email to a robot. That robot grabs a box of bolts, sets it on this robot you see here, created by BMW and NVIDIA, and the robot drives the bolts to the spot where they're needed. So it's an autonomous vehicle that never leaves the plant. This is an example of something that's done using neural nets. Does it have to work? Yes. Do you care why it works or the different things that went into it? No, you just want to make sure that the bolts got there. You didn't have to have a person running around the plant because a lot of things could happen in the plants. If the, if, if the uh, uh, logistics robot got into an accident, that would be as much of a problem as a person getting into an accident. So it, it can make, actually makes the environment safer for workers. Really good example of some of the creative things that can be done using neural nets. Um, did we just do a real quick check on time, how we're doing? Is, we're, I'm sorry, what time do we finish? I'm sorry? 15. 15, that's what I thought. So we're right on time. Not a whole lot more to cover, we've got about 10 more minutes. Understanding the technology. We live in an interconnected world. To make ML and AI work, we have to have a connection. Now, to make something happen in an auto plant, you need three things. You need a person doing a job. You need a part that's being worked on or screwed into something, something like that. You need a machine to do it. All three have to be connected. All three have to be in the same place at the same time and functioning. AI needs to have a constant connection between people, parts, and machines to make sure it works. So that's going to change how you build your plant. If you're going to use it in some other situation, it's still the same strong communication infrastructure is required. AI fails often when it does fail. It often fails not because of a problem with the algorithm, but because of the, with the communication infrastructure or how it's used or it takes too long to load the data. These infrastructure and data barriers are much more often the cause of algorithm failure than the algorithm actually failing. Cybersecurity, talk about an interconnected world, think about a plant, think about all the different connections, and every connection is a possible place for intrusion. And the more complex the system, the more places there are for people to attack the system. Some uh, friends of ours.
who uh, have recently had data breaches. Get a cybersecurity expert. You're going to do this in the plant, or maybe you're doing this with a marketing database. However, you're going to be using uh, ML and AI. You're going to need a couple of kinds of experts, and not just the coders for the ML and AI. You need a cybersecurity expert because it works by making connections. Just imagine if you were uh, taking information from a vehicle and you're analyzing the information from the vehicle, it had to get off the vehicle. And so you've got that information uh, being transferred from one computer to another, sometimes being broadcast on a coded channel. Think about when you have more AI and ML, think about the security holes it can create. This is something that often gets overlooked. So you want to have a cybersecurity expert go over your AI system to make sure there aren't any vulnerabilities. Constant change. Things are changing all the time. The picture here is a bunch of computers that were somebody's pride and joy at some point, and they're in the dumpster. Things change. They change fast. And so our algorithms can be like that. Our algorithms can constantly evolve. You know, it used to be that in the old days you'd build a statistical model and maybe you just go on to the next model and never rebuild it. Um, now, models, are, people are aware that models and effectiveness wears out a little bit over time. They drift, as it said. So we're going to monitor their performance. We can continue to build new models, tweak the models, even build completely new ones. We can ultimately design AI that learns, and every day more data comes in, and every day the model retrains itself just a bit. We can fight against drift by turning our models into, cons into constant learners, not period. We're not going to wait six months or a year, God help us, never, and rebuild a new model from scratch. We're going to design systems that are intended to keep on learning all the time. And that'll keep us up with uh, our pace of change we need a flexible in infrastructure to do that. So when you're talking about what's needed to make AI actually work, to make it deliver its benefits, change is a way of life. Here's a uh, machine learning algorithm that has a learning curve. It gets smarter the more times you run it. That's why they call it machine learning. It actually learns. It gets better at predicting whatever it's supposed to predict. In the same way, we can design systems that are constantly improving, like an algorithm learns. It isn't like I'm going to take an algorithm offline and I'm going to train it, I'm going to run it 10,000 times, and, and it's pretty smart, and I run 12,000 times, and okay, that's a little better, I run it 14,000 times, and it really didn't improve, it's leveling off, that's great. We're going to use that algorithm, and now we're going to deploy it, and I'll see you in six months, or a year, or never. No, 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 we want to have systems that continue to evolve, and that's technology, that's algorithms, that's the skills people have that are using the technology. It becomes a whole new mindset that involves embracing change. Just as the algorithm continue to learn, it's an atmosphere of constant change that's going to make the best use of AI and ML. Culture and governance. We're going to talk a little bit more about that mindset. CICD is a paradigm. It's more than just the technology. You see the robot running around the plant, you think that's an amazing technology, but it's also a frame of mind. You TOGAF fans will recognize the little picture there. I'm a big TOGAF fan myself. It's an iterative process. It's the idea that we're not going to build something new from scratch, go away, come back later. We're, instead, we're going to have a process that gets a little better, a little better, a little better, and we're deploying technological advanced, better algorithms, new data sources. We're constantly in the atmosphere of bringing in, tweaking, making it a little better, making it a little better, making it a little better. If you've ever seen an automotive race, the pit crew isn't just changing tires. They're looking at the performance of the, of the vehicle, and they're changing constantly in the course of a two- or three-hour race. We need to be thinking about our algorithms that way so that they're constantly learning and evolving. It's a mindset of iterative project development instead of waterfall. You can still use waterfall mentality to develop algorithms, and they'll work fine for a few days or a few weeks. 
it, to get the full use of it and have the greatest impact, you need to ch we need to change the way we think to be like those algorithms, to be iterative and to be constantly improving. Continuous integration, continuous delivery. Small changes, always getting a little better. Short sprints, agile mentality. Work culture, this is how work used to be done. Pyramids, pyramids are still there, they're thousands of years old. They're probably how your house was built. This is not how new technology is built. This is how new technology is built, we got a cell phone factory there. Automated processes, latest technology. There's a factory out in California that's making TV sets. Makes 1.2 million TVs a month. It has 25 people working there. That's the kind of mentality we need to be getting at. What can be automated? What can be optimized? What can leverage automation, AI, ML to run more efficiently? Look at modern processes. A culture change is needed as much as technology. The greatest barrier to AI adoption isn't the technology. Look at this conference. We got amazing smart people. We have fantastic vendors with wonderful products. Yeah, we're going to keep working on the technology. We're not going to say, oh, this was a great conference and we'll never have one again. We're going to have another conference next year and it's going to be a great conference. But you know what? The greatest barrier isn't the technology. It's a barrier, but it continues to improve. The thing that holds AI back the most actually isn't the tech. A guiding principle. Talk about continuous evolution. So look at the to-do list. What am I going to do this week? I'm going to deploy version 4.1. I'm testing 4.7, which hasn't been out yet, hasn't been deployed. That'd be on the top. I'm developing 4.8. I'm ideation on 4.9. I'm doing business requirements for 4.11. Every week I'm deploying a new version of the algorithm. So this is a continuum, in this case I'm using, to use Azure language, these are sprints, we're using one week sprints, but the idea of continuous incremental change, that mindset is needed as much as the technology. That'll have more impact than just being able to write code and get a better algorithm. Driving adoption of AI, advancing the technology. How do we make this stick? We're gonna start with a proof of concept. One specific small problem fix that, that's going to win fast and it's going to create a champion. Whoever was the business leader that led that project, they get credit for it and they're going to be able to adapt that, adopt that and, and use it to drive at a greater adoption of ML and AI. Do proof of concept products, small problems that can be knocked out cleanly and quickly. And with that, you've got champions that are going to say, well, I did this over here, let's do something over here. Oh, that might take six months, not eight weeks. Proof of concept projects, find champions that are going to talk about this. That's going to drive the cultural change. Iterative process development, teamwork. Not one person leading, but a group of people, and everyone's ideas are valid. But the final answer is, does the algorithm work better? So. In addition to whatever you have, part of that mindset change, find some time, block it out. I like to block it out on my calendar. I actually put it as an appointment to myself on my calendar, nobody else invited. Commit to do something each week. Put it on your calendar, make an appointment with yourself if that's how you schedule things. Do something every week that's gonna drive adoption of the technology. The technology, it's gonna work. That's not the greatest barrier. Changing your mindset is part of that barrier, there's one more. Find those champions, get them to have that relationship. Now we're talking about, we've completely left technology behind. We're not talking about te tech at all, we're talking about how to gain people's trust to use the good technology. Use those champions to drive adoption. Align performance, this is HR. Align performance rewards with how well with production of implementation. So you get greater performance for the business leaders when they have greater adoption of automated processes. It has to be part of the HR to make it really stick. 
So it becomes normative. It becomes an ordinary part of things people do every day. This is going to sound real familiar if you heard the keynote. Adoption moves at the speed of trust. Take everything you've heard of the keynote, I'll cut to the chase. Talk about the speed of trust. Um, we're going to take that same idea from Stephen Covey. We're going to apply it to AI and ML adoption. It moves. The greatest challenge isn't the technology. Above that is a change in mindset. And beyond that, simply getting people to trust what you're doing that is going to make things perform better. The relationships, the trust in the technology is the single greatest barrier to adoption we face. Keys to success. AI is a faithful servant, but a terrible master. You might have heard this phrase described, used to describe money. Money is a good servant, it's a bad master. If you're serving money, you've got problems. If you use money as a tool to solve problems, that's good. If you ever heard that, it's, a, it's the sort of thing you teach your teenager when they get their first job. But here it applies to AI. It's a great tool, it's a terrible master. It, we have to make it work for us, not us working for it. We don't live to make the AI perform better. We do our jobs to get better performance, and we're aided with AI to get there. Lower cost, data-driven, automated. Time for questions. Question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. In the case of optimization, what you, um, to repeat the question back to if folks haven't heard it, an optimization is that a function, like the language that gets used in ALI, AI a lot or ML a lot, we talk about a loss function. Rather than that in optimization, it isn't one, it's multiple. So we'll have, in that case, again, I talked about optimization being an odd duck and there are people who specialize in this. Instead of having a loss function, we're gonna shrink some numbers, something like that, what we'll normally have is a series of equations. That's why it's sometimes called linear programming, because each equation is a line. It's a constraint on the system. You can't make, uh, you can't put parts out of the line faster than you can get parts in. Whether it's supply chain or anything else, you can't get, build cars faster than you can get chips. That's a constraint. There's a lot of constraints on the system. Each one is a single simple expression. You might have a lot of constraints, but each one is one simple thing that the system can't outperform. So it isn't one function, it's, it's multiple functions, multiple equations, but it's still the same concept you're working, you're talking about. It's multiple things, but rather than being multivariate, chunk, 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 all in one equation, regression is like that. Uh, 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 decision trees are like that. Um, do this one first, then this one first, then this one first. But in the case of optimization, there are multiple lines of an equation and they all have to work together to find that optimal solution. Good question. If you think of like a, um, for us, um, sorry, for optimization, for, for linear programming, let's say you have two constraints. We have the state that's a two dimension. Um, the idea is that you can optimize any physical thing that's a variable by flipping the code of that state. So the maximum or minimum of, of whatever the objective is, The corners, the vertices, or it, this might take a little bit of a stretch. So a lot of folks aren't used to thinking this way. What if you have 12? There's no reason why you can't do 12 dimensions. We can't visualize it very easily, but we can certainly write it on the board. And maybe there are 12 different important rules that you have to follow for this particular situation. Each rule gets one line. We're going to find the corners of that space, yet they still exist in 12 dimensions. And at those corners, we're going to find the best solutions. Great example. Thank you. I'm sorry, um, can I do that? I think I can back up. That one? We'll just leave it on that. Neur the question is, can we have an example of neural network hidden bias? I'll give you two examples, so you get two for the price of one. Um, biases are a problem. Uh, in neural networks especially, and they tend to come from one of two different things. Um, 
One I'll call the spaghetti problem, and one I'll call the history problem. We'll do the history problem first. One of the things that people use AI badly all the time to do, I, I talked about labeled data, decisions that were made in the past. If we use history, if we look at how decisions were made and those decisions were biased, we're going to take the historical records and how people decided, and then we're going to use that to train the AI. We've now trained the AI to be biased. Give you an example. Let's suppose that uh, you've, got, uh, you've got an algorithm, uh, two different versions of the same problem. Um, if there was a good example, great example, unfortunately, is the Compass algorithm. It's a neural network algorithm that was used to set bail for people. And it would say, okay, with this and this crime and the police said this and blah, 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 and text analytics and all of these things, I was a completely black box algorithm, which was a catastrophe for this particular problem. They ought to have used decision trees. But anyway, they used neural net, which you can't explain to anybody. You don't know how it works. It's black box. And sure enough, you know what they found? They found out that it was putting black folks in jail and letting people with lighter color skin go free a whole lot more often than would make sense. Now, this was a problem in the past, but they trained the new algorithm on the past bad decisions. They taught the machine to discriminate. And they couldn't tell because they used a black box algorithm. So that's one source of bias. And what it comes from is, when the data that you put in was biased to begin with, the labeling, we got these one, these were one category, these were another like broken or not, or male or female, or hired or not hired, we'll get to that one in a minute, or yes and no. When there was bias in the original decision used to feed it in, biased data, biased out. The other th kind of problem we get to, I'll call the spaghetti problem. Um, if you ever heard the, the figure of speech, how do you know when spaghetti's done, you throw it out the wall and it sticks? I don't know if you've ever heard that, but uh, actually if you do that, it's probably a little overcooked. But anyway, so that's my Italian wife who knows better than I do. But this is especially a problem when there are many, many, many variables to look at. I talked about the World Bank data, two and a half thousand things. You get into text analytics, you can get into tens of thousands of possible words, and are they predictive? Give an example. Now, I can't swear to this one. I can only talk to the news report. The news report was from a whistleblower who talked to Reuters in Europe, and this was from a major, major, major software company uh, that's based in California. Uh, and I'm not going to say who it is. That doesn't matter. But what they did was they were uh, scanning resumes. And this is a big, big, big powerhouse of a company. They get a lot of resumes in. Uh, and so what they were looking at, not only did they repeat the historical problem, which I just talked about, the people who got hired, the people who didn't, so they had that historical problem of bias data in, but also they would use anything that was predictive. That's why I call it the spaghetti problem, anything that hits, sticks to the wall. Anything that sticks we're going to use. This is a real risk when you're using uh, AI on text because you don't know why that's important. In this particular algorithm, as it was investigated, it was found out, that, okay, there's certain things give you a little bump up in the likelihood of whether or not we're going to call you back on your resume. Other things would get you bumped down. One of the things that got you bumped down was playing softball in college. People would put on their resume all the different things they would do, and you lost points for getting called back on your resume if you played softball. Do a lot of men play softball? Do a lot of women play softball? And so it was biased against women in part because we don't care any word that predicts the old outcomes. That's a history problem. We'll get into that. But anything that works to make the prediction, and they, got a, a, they found a particular bit of language that was biased language. And because you had and then a biased predictor, you got a biased result. Are we running low on time? Sorry, I'm, th that, that'll finish it. But I will be here for the rest of the day. Please talk to me with any other questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you.